The BS Report is presented by Subway. Football season is over. Footlong season is just beginning. For a limited time, get any piled high regular footlong for just $5. Any footlong, just $5. Hurry in, Subway. Eat fresh. Eat fresh. The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. First of all, this is the BS Report with Bill Simmons. It might be cool, I don't know. And if it's not, I don't care. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons works for ESPN. He's also named the sports guy, and he writes a comical sports column. He must be a popular dude. The BS Report. It's got a real dirty sound, like a rusty steak knife. Cutting through a well-aged state. No. 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 Here's Bill Simmons. Yeah. All right, it's a momentous day in the BS Report. I'm here in the studio, which really masses my office at the Sports Guy Mansion. I am here with my single strangest friend, my former co-worker, the smartest person I've ever met. Thanks. Mr. Rick Rosner. Hey, Bill. <laughs> You just waved at me like we're on TV. <laughs> I get confused. This is you're breaking your podcast virginity today. Yeah. My real virginity, too. Well, you've been on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. You've been the, the feature of or the featured person on Errol Morris documentary. And now my podcast, where does this rank? Third? I'd say third. It's got to be happier than the Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. Let's talk about that first. Well, I mean, there's a lot of things to cover, and really, I don't know even where to begin. But... I think who wants to be a millionaire is the most interesting thing that's happened here. Now that Slumdog Millionaire has become sure. an Oscar winner, it's almost like picking a scab that had already been healed for you. I, I, I like picking scabs. Okay. so Though it happened almost nine years ago. Right, but, but for you, the pain is still as fresh as it was the first day. I, I still get annoyed, yeah. Yeah. So this show starts. You you have an IQ of roughly $3 million. What What's your actual IQ? It, it, it's really. I'm really good at taking IQ tests. Right. And when you get that good, you really, who knows what you're measuring. So you're in the high hundreds. Yeah. Like realistically, I, you're in the 170, 180, 190 range. I've take. I've gotten those scores on tests. What did you do on it on the SATs back in the day? The first time, 1550. Yeah. Then I took it on LSD just to see what that was like, and I got a 1500. This is back when. 1,600 meant something when only five people got 1,600s right. every year. Now hundreds of people do it. They made it a little easier. But did you get obsessed like you so often do with things and try to get the 1,600 or no? Now my parents said, now, you're only taking it once. This was before parents pushed everybody. Right. That would have been interesting for you because you're kind of a self-pusher too. I don't know what, what the results We didn't know. It was, it, I, I graduated high school for the first time in 78, and, you know, people – Everybody just sticked around all the time. It was right. Let's actually let's start there. Let's let's start with the high school. So you graduated high school in 1978. Yeah, but that wasn't the only time you graduated high school because you decided well, to go back. I graduated for the last time in '87. How many times were there at all? There was the real time. There was the '87 time. There was half a semester class of '79, and then there was an unsuccessful attempt to be in the class of '80. And then you went back in 87? 80, yeah. So you went back in 79 because you were dissatisfied with the high school experience the first time around. Well, back then, it was all about losing your virginity before you graduated yep. high school. All the movies were, you know, losing it and the Hollywood nights and just – you felt like a schmuck if you – Those movies were in the 80s, though. You're talking about in the – but the, when you graduated in the 78 – yeah. That was like the days to confuse. All you did was smoke pot and drive around in a car on a Friday night. Well, I did try to have sex. I I had no idea how to have sex or even talk to girls, basically. Right. But it was the disco era, and everybody was supposed to be having sex. And you weren't? Not even close. So what transpired that – so you graduate, and you're kind of an outcast, or well, you were an outcast. I was, I was smart, but I, that wasn't satisfying. I wanted to – Get laid, or at least get a girlfriend, and and that didn't happen. No, and I I was applying to Harvard, and I thought, wait a second, if I can't even get laid in a little Colorado town, how am I going to get laid if I'm going to this fancy school with all the Kennedys? Yeah, I thought I'd be lonely. It'd be November. I'd be in a crappy dorm room with a clanky radiator, yeah. and I'd flunk out. 
So you reapplied to another high school that was in a different town. Right, because I have two family. Different, yeah. I have started off in Boulder, Colorado, and then yeah. my dad and stepmom live, lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Okay. So I broke into my real high school, stole a bunch of blank transcript forms, and recreated a, created a new identity <laughs> and became a senior again. At what high school? It was Highland High, um, which is actually Beavis and Butt, Butthead's high school. Wow. And Boulder, Colorado kind of has a little – is that South Park or was South Park another Colorado town? It's I mean, it's kind of based on it's, a Colorado town. Yeah, those guys met. Parker and Stone met at, at CU, which is in Boulder. So multiple cartoons marrying your life. Sure. Um, so the New Mexico thing didn't go well either. No, no. It, poorly, in fact. Yeah, really bad. I Even got, more dissatisfying than your first experience. Yeah, my uh, my stepmom kicked me out of the house. Yeah. Uh, she didn't like what I was doing. That was her excuse for kicking me out of the house. What was really going on was she was having an affair with a guy from my dad's office, and oh. I was getting in the way of that. And, yeah, that's a, that's a hindrance. So I was in a crappy apartment, and everybody in my family was using my apartment as a place to for themselves to get laid. Yeah. But I was. You still weren't. So then in 1980, you go back again. I tried to, I thought, this is an interesting story. I bet you maybe I could sell it to somebody in Hollywood, but I had no idea how Hollywood worked. So you're like Octomom almost. Yeah, except not as successful. Not as successful, but same kind of, I'm doing this for a greater good. Uh, no, just to get publicity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I went back to be the class of 80 at uh, Hollywood High School. Cause my Hollywood work- High School here? Yeah. Wow. Because my grandpa lived on the Sunset Strip in a crappy apartment in what became the Mondrian eventually. Okay. So I I thought I'd come out here and try to sell my story of going back to high school while actually being back in high school. I thought that would be an extra hook. So so really the basis of 21 Jump Street, but without the crimes. Yes. Okay. All right. So how did that turn out? It did, like, I was on the wrong side of the street to go to Hollywood High, so they sent me to Fairfax. Oh, Fairfax wow. was going to let me in, but it was too close to the end of the year. They just passed Prop 13, which meant they were financially strapped, and they said, kid, just go back home. Okay. Which I did. So you never actually went to high school the third time? Uh, no. It was an aborted attempt. Yeah. So then what happened? Now, you you had the grades and the SATs and everything to actually go to a really, really good college. Yeah. But you didn't? No. So what happened from 1980 to 1986? I, I just ended up at CU. Okay. Oh, you so you did go to college? Yeah, but like yeah, okay. it's it's in state. It was my hometown school, and it was just a cheap place to kind of keep myself in storage for a few years. And did you graduate? Not then. How many semesters did you complete successfully? I don't know. I went there like six years, and I maybe accumulated three years worth of credit. I was bouncing bars. I was uh, stripping. I was. <laughs> it's hard to go to class in the morning when you've you know you've been working in a bar till two in the morning. Explain the bouncing bars part because there's a rationalization for that. All right, the, it, it's the same as the go back to high school thing. When I was a high school senior for real, I used the Freedom of Information Act to access my uh, high school permanent record, and I found out all my IQ scores. Okay, and they were all, all only like 150. I thought, that's not really very smart. If I go to, like, a really good college, everybody will be that smart. And I'll only be average smart, and I'll be really socially awkward. Okay. And it'll suck. Yeah. So I wasn't as smart as I wanted to be or as I had hoped to be, so I decided to learn how to live life as a guy with, like, regular intelligence. And for me, that meant going to the gym, lifting weights, talking like Barbarino, and, uh, Getting jobs where I was basically meat, like a stripper or a bouncer. You actually taught yourself to, to speak like Vinnie Barbarino. For well, not great, on. but yeah, yeah, you know, you did an imitation of him, right? And I, I put the, you know, I tried to comb my hair that way. I put the collar up, you know, and you worked out, you got in shape. Yeah, you bounced. Yeah, but where does the male stripper thing? I mean, I don't really know anybody who's a male stripper. Well, my dad's a much better looking guy than I am. Yeah, yet I was down there when my stepmom was having a blatant affair right <laughs> right under him. He's a workaholic, and he didn't notice, but he should have. And yeah. it was. And I thought, all right, my dad, who's better looking than me, is having this horrible 
thing right, happened to him. Right. And what am I going to do, you know, being all geeky and everything? I need to acquire some sexual power. Right. So I thought I'd become a stripper, and, like, the term didn't exist, but I thought that cougars would take me home, teach me all sorts of sex tricks. The sex ropes. Yeah. Okay. Which I could use to obtain power in future relationships. And did that happen? Not not even close. <laughs> not even remotely. Well, uh, one one woman did take me back to my uh, room in the frat. And... Be, be careful how you tell the story. Okay. Well, because, well, you know, it's Disney, ESPN. Okay. okay. Well, just, I mean, she was the, she, I knew her from the gym before I knew her from the strip joint. I don't know. And she was like 88 pounds. She was from Romania. Yeah. She was married to a guy who uh, checked groceries. Was it Nadia Comaneci? No, her name was Marinella. Okay. She was just like, she looked like a skinned rabbit. She was really skinny. Um, and she taught you the ropes? No, not no. We had really bad sex once. So, so by 1986, how old are you by now? Like 27, 28? I'm 26 in 86. Your life just has not been satisfying up to this point. It's been okay, but it's been okay, but not what you wanted. Yeah, sure. You haven't reached your potential. No. So you go back to high school again. I, I, I had a, I have a theory of the universe. Yeah. I, I don't believe in the Big Bang. Okay. Um, I believe there are a lot of crackpots running around who don't believe in in Einstein. They don't believe in special or general relativity. I totally believe in Einstein, but I don't think relativity goes quite far enough, and I think there are certain extensions you can make in relativity that will uh, pick up a lot of the slack that like, is taken up by hokey things like dark matter and dark energy. All right, you're making my head hurt. All right. Anyway, I have had this theory. Still have it. I wanted a nice, quiet place to sit and think about it for a while. So, so you, thought, need to, you needed to percolate. Yeah. So I thought, all right, I like high school. I know how to do high school. I'll just go back to high school one more time, the last possible time since my hair is going away. And you, know, and you had like a five o'clock shadow <laughs> near the end of the near the end of every school day. Yeah, I had I. At the beginning of the day, I looked about 20, and then by the end of the school day, gravity took over, and I looked about 24. What high school was this? I started off for summer school at Del Norte High in Albuquerque, and then for the fall semester, it was El Dorado High in Albuquerque. Yeah. Uh, where a uh, famous quarterback, uh, Everett, yeah, Jim, Jim Everett. Everett comes out, I think, El Dorado. Really? I think. And then for the spring semester, it was... Uh, a school that used to be called Ben Franklin in Spanish Harlem, but got shut down because it was just a, 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 a unsuccessful school full of violence and everything, and they remade it into the uh, Manhattan Center for uh, Science and Math. In New York? Yeah. So you did a fall semester in New Mexico and a spring semester in New York? Yeah. And how did that work out for you? It was okay. Uh, my legal guardian for the spring semester was my fake cousin who is now my wife. Oh. So there there's a little romance in the air. Yeah. So did you did you graduate? Like did you Yeah, I got a diploma, diploma? and everything. I got a regent's diploma. That's what? that's the fancy high school diploma out of New York. That's pretty good. Did you um I mean did you have any romance like illicit romances with I did have a high school girlfriend in Albuquerque. But she was I was she 18? She was 17 and then turned 18 at some point. But I told her what the deal was. I said, look, I'm not supposed to. I told her the truth. I said, I'm way older than I'm pretending to be. Yeah. And um, that's why I'm not going to be trying to have sex with you. Okay. And she was okay with that? Yeah. I, so this is like a bad 1980s movie that didn't really totally have a plot except for the part where you met your future wife. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really how it played out. Yeah. You met a wife out of it. You, it took four high schools, but you met your wife. Well, I decided if she could go along, she's a a fairly timid person. Yeah. But if she could have the the balls to to go along with the charade that I thought she would be. A, she was a keeper. Yeah. So you graduate for the fourth time. Then what happens? Well, what happens for the next, like, seven, eight years? That's, what, what are your jobs? Well, 
when you give up a fake identity, yeah, it's 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 you're sad. Because you've been playing this role like an actor. Yeah, I've been that for a year. Yeah, and I was bummed that I couldn't be that guy anymore. Um, and I was living with my future wife in New York, and I was looking for work modeling for art classes, and I was hitting all the. Uh, because that's anybody can do that. You just stand there naked. You know, you can read a book while you're doing it and all. Was that. it like the Will Ferrell Saturday Night Live sketches where you know the art model that actually repulsed the people who were trying to paint them, or were you dignified? Both. Okay. I got reprimanded for like over enthusiastic poses. <laughs> but uh. So, hey, but at, at some point, didn't you realize like I need to start making money from my my really, really smart brain? I thought that I'd have this theory of the universe and somehow that would lead to everything. And in the meantime, I was, you know, posing naked. So I was looking and for... And bouncing. I only lasted one night in New York. Oh, yeah. Not to, big enough. Well, no, it was just... I worked the limelight. Yeah. And it was like 120 decibels. Yeah. And all you're doing is yelling at people to not stand on top of the speakers, but you're doing it in sign language because there's no possible way that anything you, you know. And and my boss got locked out because my walkie-talkie, I couldn't feel it against my leg. And, <laughs> and the whole thing was just so embarrassing that I said. Forget. So how did you end up in Hollywood? So I'm in New York. I'm looking for work being naked. And I at one of the colleges... Uh, there's a notice that MTV is looking for 18-year-olds to come play their game that they have in development. And this was MTV's first game show, Remote Control. And you thought this is a chance to pretend you're 18 again? Yeah. And I went there. I put my <laughs> retainer back in. And and it was really fun because everybody was smart and funny. And I'd never been around people like that before. Yeah. And they had me back because I acted stupid in the right way for MTV. Yeah. And I played it a second time, this time they got the funding to go to series. And then I wrote to him saying, you know, I really like what you guys are doing, and I'm not really as young and stupid as, as I was appearing to be, and I'll work for you guys for free. And that's the key. MTV runs off of interns. So you I know, hold on there. There's a good life lesson there because I always get emails from people, how do I break in, how do I get somewhere, how do I get a career started? It really comes down to just, giving up like a year of your life for either no money or very little money and just killing yourself for that year to try to get to the place you want to go. Well, that's that's definitely the VH1 MTV model. It's a lot of models. And and you they work your butt off and I went from working for $0 a week and then I got a raise to $200 a week. Cuz eventually they feel bad or they see that you're doing something valuable. Right. But so then they start paying me $200 a week, which is Still basically nothing. But I had a girlfriend. But, I mean, you're, if you work for MTV, you're not entirely working for free because you're young and you're working with a bunch of other young people. And It's a cool thing to tell people. But yeah, I work for MTV. You're working to get laid, basically. Mm -hmm. But you had a girlfriend. I did. So I didn't. And plus, I have no game. So I wouldn't have gotten laid anyway. Right. But everybody else working for MTV for free is working... You know, for the incidental, they've just worked you a 14-hour day. You're hooking up with somebody, you know, at right. 3 in the morning while you're sorting index cards. So this eventually leads to what? Um, uh, the head writer fell in. I was a fact checker on the uh, on remote control. Yeah. There was another fact checker. Um, there was the head writer kind of fell in love with the other fact checker and made her a writer and couldn't make her a writer without making me a writer, so I became a writer. And then you became a writer for what after that? Nothing. Then then I moved to L.A. because New York was gross, and my wife wanted to move back to L.A. And uh, I went back to bouncing and, uh, and modeling for art classes for three years. And how did you get hooked up with uh, your writing partner, Paul Raff? Uh, we met on – we were the two filthiest, most – messed up people on remote control. Okay. So when he came out to LA, you know, we, we hooked up again and started, you know, writing spec stuff together and, uh, ended up getting a William Morris agent. Really? Raph got the agent. Yeah. Um, Raph was working on this horrible 
ESPN game show. I don't remember what it was called, but it had something to do with the covers of Sports Illustrated. I don't, it la- I don't even remember that. It lasted like a season. Oh, and wow. He was kind of hitting on the show's Vanna. Yeah. Because, you know, Raph. Because he's Raph. And, and she, her boyfriend was a William Morris agent who kind of saw what was going on and decided to head it off. To keep your enemies close. Right, by making him a client. Nice. So we became little tiny William Morris clients. And then that eventually led to the Mancha. Yeah, we we met Jimmy when he was a little tiny William Morris client. Yeah. Mancha, and all of a sudden you're a real Hollywood writer. Yeah, and I mean we did a lot of, we did like a bunch of, you did like a lot of like clip shows right, and stuff for, like for, that, right? For the company that does when animals attack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you get all these clips of like rhinoceroses stampeding people. And... Well, they wouldn't let us write the drama. They, yeah. We had to write the comedy. The comedy is you take the same dramatic clip, but you play it really fast and you put funny music under it. And it, and all the St. Bernard, you know, the German shepherd biting a reporter's face. You it's, play it fast, it's funny. You play it slow with ominous music, and it, it it's frightening. Interesting. All right, so this all leads to who wants to be a millionaire. Kind of. So you're in L.A. You yeah. have a real job. You now have a wife. You have a daughter. Not yet, but yeah. yeah oh, yeah, wait, like no, 2000. I'm sorry. You're, you're right, you're right. Your life's turned out pretty good at this point. Yeah. The show is created called Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. Yeah. It's in your wheelhouse. Yeah, because I've been... It's a trivia show, but it's... Now, why didn't you ever do Jeopardy? I did Jeopardy back in Gulf War One. And how did that go? Came in second. Second? Yeah. How what happened? When you go on Jeopardy, nobody does the math. Four out of five people lose on Jeopardy. Yeah. Um, and I just I got beat by a woman who won four times, and she was going for a double doctorate in international affairs and something else. And she just knew more stuff about flags of the world than I did. Did you choke? No, I was ahead at well, I was at the ahead at the uh, end of single Jeopardy. Yeah. And then double Jeopardy came along with flags of the world, and she and knew what it. the Saudi America Saudi Arabian flag looked like. And um, yeah, I, I I got a lot of points for coming in second. Okay. But so, who wants to be a millionaire starts, and you're thinking, I'm in the wheelhouse here. You yeah. get your what was it the pilot episode or the first week episodes? I got on the first one. You made the the that, that ring group. of what they call the the geeks call the ring of fire, and, which is the ten people trying to get into the middle. And tell the story of what happened. Um, oh, I think I I got one right. Either the fastest finger deal that they used to use to get into the middle. Yeah. I was one of a couple people out of the, I think, nine remaining contestants to get it right, and they threw it out because there was some kind of irregularity, like Regis didn't, he skipped a word when he read the question or something. Maybe a little suspicious. No, not suspicious, just maybe a choice that the producers made. They looked at, you know, who was, they could have, you know, they could have kept it, they could have thrown it out, they chose to throw it out. So if you were a hot blonde who was like a rocket scientist, maybe they keep it in. Well, I wasn't necessarily the one who got the fastest. It was between me and uh, another guy, as far as I know. Okay. So that Either, doesn't work out. How did you end up coming back? Well, you could come back. You could. You play the phone game. You call every day as many times. I forget how many times they'd let you call. And when people, you know, people listening to this have, have, have just met you, so they don't know this, but you're one of the most obsessive people maybe who's ever lived. I'm, I'm good. I'm. Gonna, I'm part of a reality show where they're trying to fix me. <laughs> really? Yeah, it's called Obsessed. And uh, What channel is that on? I think it's going to be A&E in a couple months. They're going to try to fix you and not make you as obsessed? Well, yeah, like stop me from going to the gym eight times a day. Stop me from only turning clockwise. You don't even have OCD. It's like something well beyond. Well, it's it's... No, it's, it's, it's like it's, triple OCD. You'd think so, except I guess the other people on the show are way more messed up than I am. They're a little frustrated with me that I'm not more messed up. and the, Because it, you're not like wiping sinks a hundred times a day. You're, your yeah. OCD is actually more beneficial to you as a person. Well, like it, it hasn't entirely wrecked my life. Right. There, some of their other people you know, can't keep jobs because of their behaviors and stuff. 
So when you finally, so you're doing the phone game over and over again, you finally get back on. Yeah. And if you, you know, the Errol Morris show is on YouTube. Yeah. I urge everybody to go look for it for the scene where Rick, Rick wins fastest finger and your reaction. Now you, you claim now that there was a little like th- theatric well, side to the reaction, but, but I, I, I don't went know. Off, I went You're off not like, that good of an actor. I went off like a crazy gorilla. I thought it was legitimate. I don't think you played it up. I think you were legitimately that excited. Well, I was. So Errol Morris has it in slow motion for like 30 seconds. And, uh, in my opinion, it's one of the greatest 30 seconds ever that's ever been captured. But so you get on, you get to 16,000, yeah. and what happens? They ask me, let's see, it's been a long time, but what capital city is located at the highest altitude? It's been a long time. Like you don't know the exact word in the question. I, well, I, I will go months at a time without thinking about the, the question. Okay. I don't yeah. believe that, but go ahead. All right. It's, they ask, what capital city is located at the highest altitude above sea level? Yeah. And then they give you four world capitals. Quito, Bogota, Mexico City, and Kathmandu. It's been a while, but you rattled those off. Well, yeah, I know those cities. <laughs> now, a couple problems here. They phrased it so that it was the highest. Yeah. Right? But, well, it's, it's the But main... actually, there was a higher one that they didn't even list. Right. So that threw you off. Well, no... I didn't know that didn't there know was the a answer. higher one. No, but eight other times previous to me. Oh, and also subsequent to me. They they aired factually, and they bring the contestant back. Hmm. But in your case, no. In th- it, they they kind of stonewalled in my case, saying that I was. They meant which was the highest of those four cities. Right. They phrased it incorrectly. They phrased it incorrectly, plus... But you, did, you still didn't know the answer, though. No, but neither did the eight people who were brought back. We forgot to mention one thing. Yeah. As you were preparing for Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, you decided that there was a way for you to memorize pretty much all the information in the world, correct? No, not ex- I took the World Almanac, and I just tried to read it cover to cover. I tore it into five pieces, so I'd have like a 100 or a 200-page chunk to carry with me at all times. And you just read it over and over again? Well, no, I just went through and the, you know the relevant. Do you have a photographic memory? Nope. It's so it's a good to, memory. You try but... to absorb as much as you could. Yeah. So when this question came up, you weren't totally. You didn't know it. Well, I could I. I knew the altitude of Mexico City, which is I forget now, but it was it's like seventy three or seventy five hundred, and I knew it to the foot for some reason. Now. I was a big fan of this show. I thought it was kind of a hard question for sixteen thousand. It was particularly since it would world capitals are harder than state capitals. Yeah. Right. So, a few, like a month or two months before, at thirty-two thousand, somebody had missed the highest state capital. So that would be an indicator that maybe that's the level that question should have been asked. Yeah, or maybe even higher. Be you know, because the person missed it at 32. Yeah. But anyway. So this sent you in a kind of a spiral. A little bit. Well. You were devastated. Yeah, I was bummed. You're crushed. Because you can't come back. Once you're on, you can't. There's yeah. no second chance. Well, I, mean, I was I was bummed that I'd screwed it up. And then when I found out that they had they didn't even include the correct answer, then, you know, I went pretty crazy. And... There may or may not have been a legal dispute that we won't mention, but as all of this was going on, you were hired by our friend Jimmy to write for his television show. Yeah. So you end up working. Well, that's 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 you testimony to the generosity of Jimmy, who. All right, you don't have to kiss his ass. He's not here. Yeah, but still. I know, but it's a good point. But this company that that ran the show that broke your heart ended up giving you a career for the rest of the decade. Yeah. So it's kind of funny how it worked out. Yeah. And now you've been a writer on Jimmy's show for the last seven years. And I personally have never seen anybody work harder. Thanks. Or spend more time working. I mean, it was like a running joke. Like, <laughs> well, you, you show up for work first and you're there. You leave and you're still there. Well, the dispute with over who wants to be a millionaire made me work harder because I'm thinking. You're worried. ABC is, must hate me. Right. 
Um, so I need to work extra hard to show that I'm an impeccable employee. So you were an outcast in high school and searching for, and now you're on a, a late night comedy show with some of the funniest people around and everybody's goal is to make every, everybody else laugh every day. And you were trying to do it from the IQ sense. You were trying to figure out how to be a comedy writer, basically. Correct? Yeah. Do you feel like you've figured out most of it, all of it, half of it? I'm, I'd am i say, you know, in high school sports, somebody gets the most improved trophy every season. Yeah. i, I got to be that guy because when I started, I was – well, you were there. I was there. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm much, you, much better. You, you got better while I was there. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I still go in every day with the intention to be better today than I was the day before. It worried me the first few months when you were actually keeping stats on who got what jokes and ideas in Act One. And at one point, <laughs> pitches approved. At one point, you were leading me like 46 to 39, and you just well, casually mentioned that, and I was like, you're keeping track of this? Well, because I want to improve. Right. And because I was nervous. And because I boil everything down into numbers. You know, I've got the who you know born-to-do-math tattoo. Yes, you do have a born-to-do-math tattoo. Um, but that's bothered me that you never got involved in sports statistics, because I feel like we could have revolutionized basketball or something. The past two years running, I've come in second in the uh, March Madness pool at Kimmel. Have you really? Yeah. Is there? Do you have some sort of system? It's it's the easiest system in the world. Let's hear it. You just go with the Vegas line. Everybody like gets all tricky and stuff. You go with the seeds. You know, seventh beats tenth. You know. You basically take the higher seed every time. Just about, unless where Vegas and a lot of everybody else says no, nah, it's not going to go that way. So you pick the favorite in every matchup. Yeah. And for the past, the last two years have been really favorite intensive. Yeah. So. But how do you get, like, how do you, in the later rounds, how does that you, work? you got to look at the Vegas line at who's, who's odds on to win it overall. Interesting. Cause, so you finish second each time. Yeah. Just using Vegas odds. Basically, yeah. Well, how, do, how are we going to figure out basketball stats? I feel like we could figure this out. There's got to be some formula that we could figure out. Which kind of basketball? Like how to measure players. Everybody's trying to measure players now. I mean, you want to money ball the NBA. Money ball for basketball. I don't know because I've done, I mean, because most gambling. I'm going to work on this with you. Okay. There's some sort of fantasy. There's some sort of sports thing I think you could become obsessed over and figure out. If anyone can do it, it's you. Okay. Um, all right. Let's talk about some of the weird things about you. Okay. Um, you got hair plugs. Well, talk, talk about hair plugs. Well, I'm, I'm eager to talk about hair because yeah. look how much hair I have right now. You were always jealous of my hair. You 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 haven't lost hair. You still have every hair you were born with. You, in fact, one of the first things you said to me was you complimented my hair, and I was like, "Is is this guy gay?" But no, no I look at everybody's hair. hair. You love my hair. I, I want your hair. Right. So, so when did you get the plugs? I started with the plugs when I got to L.A. in '89, and I've had I had 13 procedures from. 89 to 97, and I have 1,650 plugs in my head. Now, part of the reason for that is that you're – I hate saying the word cheap, but you're, you're probably the cheapest person Yeah, I'd get a met. few at a time, and I'd go to like – I'd go after all these introductory deals, like we'll give you 200 plugs for 200 bucks. Right. I'd go to that guy, <laughs> and you know, a bunch of them would get infected, yeah. which is fun actually because you can pop them all, and you've, if you like popping zits – there's nothing like popping an infected hair plug. <laughs> well, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> so you've had – actually, I, I mentioned the other day, I think your hair looks as good as it's ever looked. I found a combination of stuff. I don't think anybody ever has to go bald again. Yeah. And if I knew this – if this combination existed before plugs, I wouldn't have gotten the plugs. Okay. And it's cheap, though it is a little bit involved. You have to do three things. Yeah. You have to use a certain shampoo, Nizoral, N-I-Z-O-R-A-L. It's – you just buy the non-prescription stuff. It's like 15 bucks a bottle at any drugstore. This stuff eats the DHT, which is a form of testosterone that kills your hair. Mm -hmm. You put it on your head. You maybe don't wash all of it out. You leave a little bit of bit of it on there. Does it smell? A little shampoo-y. Okay. All right. So you do that. 
then you do the uh, minoxidil, which is really cheap now. You go to get you get the Costco minoxidil, six bottles for twenty bucks. All right. What's the third part? The third part is one of these prostate drugs. Any any anytime you see a commercial with old guys going to the bathroom a lot, that's a drug you want to take to keep your hair. The Why? Avidart, because the same thing that makes your prostate blow up is what is what gets into your follicles and gunks them up. Huh. So the shampoo goes after the, it's called DHT, dihydrotestosterone. Yeah. And it's this fatty stuff that it accumulates in, in susceptible people and it chokes off their follicles. So, so the shampoo eats that stuff. The minoxidil does something where it keeps your hair growing even when it's starting to get choked. And then the Avidart or the Propecia or the Proscar uh, knocks that stuff out of your system. So you're growing hair. I've, I've, I've got a little bit of hair in places where I probably haven't had hair in 20 years. Wait, why couldn't you combine all three and then just market it? Rick Rasner's hair. Well, because... You're, someday you'll run on the bottom of my column along well, with the erectile well, drugs no, cause and the like, hair replacement. Because I'm not in the hair growing business. I'm in the business of telling people, here's what you can do, and it's not very expensive. 15-bottle okay. bottle of shampoo. Oh, we got it. We heard you the yeah, first Okay, time. you know. So. Oh, and also, if you, you can get the Propecia and the Avidart by prescription, or you can buy them from India on the Internet without a prescription. Now, I've never met anybody who cared more and less about their appearance at the same time than you did. Because, like, you got the hair plugs. Yeah. You got a nose job. It was free. <laughs> it was a practice nose job at NYU. They needed noses to work on. And and you're happy with that how that worked out? Yeah, because it was a great deal because not only did you have the student, but you had the professor of noses right. overseeing the work. So it was like, it was a really good job. The nasal professor? What's his title? I'm sh- I don't know. Professor. Rhino, of- professor of rhinoplasty? Well, I'm sure he did other stuff. He probably, you know. You you have a beard that, yeah. like right now, it looks actually pretty good. Sometimes it doesn't look as good because you don't shave yeah, it yeah, in, evenly. Do. Yeah. Um, and you buy all your clothes from? The gay thrift store. L.A. has a bunch of uh, thrift stores called Out of the Closet. Yeah. And there used to be one right next to one of the gyms I go to. Yeah. And they have awesome clothes because all the money they make goes to fight AIDS. Yeah. Which means that they get all these cast-offs. From gay guys who, to stereotype a little bit, have great taste in clothes and take really good care of their clothes. So buying a shirt that used to belong to a gay guy is like a seal of approval. This is a good shirt. (laughs) Joe Mead. Yes. Can we say that? Sounds good to me. We'll we'll run it by uh, the boss man. Okay. Um, (laughs) So now you just kind of killed your secret, though. Well, no, the, I would have kept that one to myself because well, the, all these great clothes you had dips yeah, on. You had that was, secret to yourself. That branch out of the closet went out of business. Yeah. They got, they're redeveloping. And, so you're uh, buying all $1 shirts. I'm out pants. of shirts because I can't find good dollar shirts anymore. But you, but you have all the ones you already had. Yeah, but they're all kind of going at the elbows and tearing across the back, and they're just, you know. What's sad is I've actually decided to get rid of some of my shirts. Yeah. Because, just because I've had them for a while, and some of them are East Coast shirts or whatever, and and I was thinking like I'll give them the thrift store. No, I'll give them the Rick. I'll take a look my, at your shirt. <laughs> my friend, my friend who makes six figures every year working for a talk show. <laughs> Maybe he wants my shirts, and you'll I, take them. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I I spend all day, you know, sitting at a computer. Who you know? Who am I? You know, I don't work for you know for Goldman Sachs or anything. Right. Who am I trying to impress? What about your big toe? Still there. You oh, have, plus it's got an ingrown toenail right now. You have one big toe that, for some reason, is two to three times the size of the other toe. Yeah. And why is that? I don't know. It's just some kind of genetic thing. It's always been that way? Yeah. Your toe has... has. I, I've been in rooms where a lot of things have happened, and your toe has caused the most perplexed and loud and crazed reactions that I think I've ever heard. It's it's a horrible looking foot. It's really frightening. There's a model of it now. That's how gross your foot is, is that there's been a plaster model made of your foot. Uh, silicon. Silicon model made of your foot. As well as um, 
Didn't we do? Wasn't it like in a sketch once? It's or? been in several. Because like any time anybody goes on American Idol and sings barefoot, they'll take my foot and they'll insert a shot of what their feet look like, and it's you know my horrible feet. <laughs> what else did we leave out of the uh, the wonderfully weird, weird world of Rick Rosner? Um, you have a high school daughter now, or almost? almost yeah. Well, she's. What does she think of all of this? She's. She likes to say she's not embarrassed by me. She's embarrassed for me. Well, that's that's a nice way to put it. Yeah, but it's there's still embarrassment. <laughs> there's still some. <laughs> like when we go out to dinner and like, and I take out forty pills. Yeah. What are the pills for? I want to live, you know, basically forever. So what, what kind of pills are you taking? I'm on an adrenaline blocker, a cholesterol blocker, a carb blocker, a fat blocker, a testosterone blocker, and. A bunch of vitamins. Isn't that expensive? Yeah, it probably runs, I don't know, 10 bucks a day. Yeah, but you're cheap. You don't like spending 10 bucks a day. Yeah, but being dead is the most expensive thing in the world. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. Oh, and I'm on Live Forever powder. There's this stuff called resveratrol that people think fools your body into thinking that you're starving. Because if you starve an animal, that animal lives 50% longer than an animal that's allowed to eat whatever it wants. Hmm. Well, here's the thing I don't get about vitamins. How, I mean, are we sure they work? No. Uh-uh. And when they when they figure everything out 50 years from now, it'll turn out that like three quarters of all vitamins are worthless. They just make your uh, urine colorful. It could seem like maybe it's the biggest scientific scam of all time, and none of us realize it. Well, it it the deal is, I mean. Everything I take, they've done, they've done studies to say that this is maybe how it works, if it works, but nobody knows for sure how everything works together. And, you know, stuff's still really primitive. What about the part where you hate paying for food and you'll eat anyone's leftover food? Like yeah. If there's a half a pizza and somebody's about to throw in the garbage can, you'll scream. Well, and then you'll eat the pizza. I won't scream. I'll ask politely. Or wait till they're You're gone and take of, it out of the garbage. Yeah, I've seen you take pizza out of the garbage. Yeah. But at some point, don't you have to stop doing that? I mean, you're a successful I, I, TV writer. Well, no, I've stopped doing it just because I, I, I'm i starving myself. I, I don't want to. The less you eat, the longer you live. Is that true? Yeah. Do you I Up mean, to a point. Are you better about spending money? On what? Well, because you, you save money. You're all about saving as much money as you possibly can. In fact, when when you were ordering uh, big-breasted porn movies for our friend Adam Carolla one time online. Yeah, that's my VIG is is <laughs> is an extra porn movie. <laughs> you asked him. It was like a tax because you knew how to do it. And, of course, he paid it. Well, yeah, because he's a generous man. Right. But at some point, don't you just have to say – I'm in my mid forties. I don't. I don't need to be this careful about money anymore. Or no? No, nah, because if I want to like buy a new liver or a kidney back in twenty years, when you know they start in twenty years, there'll be pigs that'll be genetically. You'll be able to have a pig that has your genes and grow replacement organs in that pig. That's not going to be cheap. You honestly believe that's going to happen? A lot of people believe that. Really? Yeah. It's kind of interesting. Why would it? Why a pig? Why would that be the animal? Pigs turn out to be, I don't know, easy to uh, work with. So what? You have all this money saved, so you're basically saving it for organs. What are you doing with it? That and just yeah, because whatever college. There's college. I bet your kid's probably gonna be smart enough to get a scholarship. I don't know, but uh, there's there's going to be all in the next twenty, thirty years. There are going to be all sorts of crazy medical advances. Yeah. But at first, they're going to be really expensive. What are your goals for the next 10 years? Because I feel like you've kind of mellowed out since I've met you. you your life had, was pretty tumultuous. You've gone here, you've done here, you've done that, you've done this. And yeah, I feel now a you've little, settled down a little. I feel, bad in, I, I feel bad if I don't do something really weird every couple of years. It just seems well, like. What was the last really weird thing you've done? You still bounce. I think that's weird. No, the the, the place where I work uh, turned into a bikini bar, which oh. is like a strip joint, but you know, but not not your style. So, what's the last weird thing you did? I don't know. This obsessed TV show is is well, it's both 
the opposite of weird because they're trying to fix me, and it's weird because I'm because it's a TV show about how messed up I am. Was well, before that? What was the last one? <sighs> um, I feel like you've mellowed out. Yeah, it's sad. Maybe when do you turn fifty, or do you want? Are you gonna lie? In like fourteen months, thirteen months, I turn fifty. Maybe that will be some sort of giant midlife crisis for you. Well, for 30 years, I've tried to write a book about some of the stupid stuff I've done. And I feel like I'm finally to the point where, you know, I've got a proposal almost ready and stuff. Well, what did we leave out of the podcast? The podcast could basically be the proposal for your book. Did we leave anything out of your weirdness? I mean, I don't want to talk about the sexual dysfunction. I think we should skip that. Well, yeah. Yeah, it's probably a good idea. Though, to go back to the... Uh... Although, let's just say that uh, <laughs> one time at the writer's table, you made an announcement of something that happened the night before, and we all stood up and applauded. Yeah, all right. That but, gives you a little bit of an indication, yeah. but go ahead. I'm just... Nobody should pay for, for pornography at all anymore. There's, no. 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 You all don't right. need to. No. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, a goal for 50, anything? It just... You know, get Just this. continue to have a job and, and yeah. making money and save for pig organs. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Write a movie? How about an autobiography? That's what I'm trying to do. But you know, for 30 years, I've, I've, I've danced around it. How could one of the world's smartest men not write a book? I mean, you sleep. What, what do you sleep? Like two hours a day? No, I, I've been trying to get more sleep, so I'm, I'm, I don't fall asleep at work. So how much sleep are you getting now? Like four hours? I got four hours last night, but a lot of nights I'll get six hours and stuff. Let's talk about sports for these last five minutes okay. since we didn't talk about sports at all. Do you have any weird sports theories coming from an outsider who's extremely smart that you want to espouse right now to an ESPN.com audience? Uh, no. It's a podcast, so we can pause it if you want to think about it. We might have to, but... Uh, like football. The whole football thing, fantasy, we've been trying to get you involved. You've been threatening to maybe get involved and have a team and figure out, like, some sort of elaborate oh, oh, here's, model for right, Well, here's players. my theory. Just, this is not a no-good theory, but, like, it's a, it's a lot of work because in fantasy football, you're going up against people who know what they're doing. Yeah. In, in betting, you want to go up against people who don't have any idea what they're doing. That's why March Madness is such a good place to bet, because you have a lot of people who... You mean a March Madness office pool? Yeah. There's no real way to make a zillion bucks off of that, but there is a way to you know, have a really good chance of winning your pool just by sticking to the favorites, because you're going up against people who don't know what they're doing, like Mickey. True. But... When you're talking fantasy football and stuff, you're, you're, those are people who spend you know 20 hours a week researching stuff. I've noticed that with my fantasy baseball draft that I just had last week, the uh, the keeper league I have with Hinch. So we had this 10 hour auction. Actually, it was only nine and a half hours this year, but there were like no secret guys. Everybody had done the same amount of homework. There were no surprises. We all liked the same people. We, you know, they there were no crazy bad bids or anything. And we basically realized that because everybody had reached an equal level of intelligence of how to approach this draft, we have 10% odds of winning every year. It's like So 90% of the time, we're going to be unhappy. Right. It's like trying to get a bargain on eBay. Can't do it. Like right. I was trying to buy my, a few years ago, try to buy cheap Legos on eBay. No, yeah. because there are thousands of people who trade Legos. So it's an even market and... Baseball cards are like that, too. You yeah. can't, you'll never get a deal on like a mint baseball or basketball card. It'll eventually always settle to the price it should be. So if you're going to do sports, you want to pick a sport that almost nobody does. For fantasy or for betting? What? I, See, I think you're right for betting. Like I, I actually thought about doing this once. I thought this would make for an interesting book. I throw myself – because I really know basketball. Like if I watch basketball, it doesn't matter, like high school – college pro, if I actually sit and watch everybody and really watch it and follow it, I can eventually figure out who's who's good and have some opinions on it. So what if I followed the WNBA 
and I threw myself into it for one year, and I watched every game, and I read everything. Is, can you bet in Vegas on the WNBA? You w- can bet on the WNBA. Would I have some sort of gigantic advantage? Yes. Because, I feel like I would. Yeah, because it's a smaller market. Yeah. And I feel like I would have such an advantage that I would go into the casinos, and they would say, it would be like 21, like they'd kick me out. They'd say, oh, no, the WNBA guy's in again. It, I know a professional gambler who whose main betting is, is college football. And during the season, it takes him 60 hours a week to do enough research to have enough of an advantage over the odds makers to make a decent profit. Hmm. I'm thinking if you pick the right sport, you could get that advantage with, you know, 25% of that effort. Well, the, really, the only way you're going to make serious money betting on professional sports, the team sports, is by – Going with underdogs, going with parlays, and doing those bets. Like, for instance, in the 2007 playoffs, which I had some success when I was in Vegas. Um, and I was riding the Golden State Warriors, who were an eighth seed going against Dallas. Yeah. Every game they played, they were plus 300. And if you parlayed them, plus 300 or plus 400 even for the series, I forget, they were like, you know, 10 to 1 or something. But if you parlayed them with, you know, one other team that you like, those odds double. Now you're looking at a hundred dollars to win twelve hundred or whatever, and that's how you're breaking it. But you have to find those teams. In general, you have to look for sports where people are making uninformed or somehow inaccurate sentimental bets. Hmm. Well, that's that's why people like the Super Bowl. Yeah. Like people like betting on prop bets and stuff in the Super Bowl because that's where everybody's just an idiot and they're throwing out weird guesses. And I have one sport. I'm going to give away this idea. It's been an idea I've, I've been holding on to. I'm going to give this away. I'm going to give this away to my BS Report listeners. Somebody will end up doing it and whatever. I think boxing is the sport that could be figured out statistically, as weird as that sounds. That seems there's probably not a lot of mathematicians in boxing. I would say there's no mathematicians because I've looked. Now, if if you argue that sports is cyclical and human beings – the performance is cyclical and, and people have the same arcs and the same declines for the most part. And things that happen mirror things that happened before. In boxing, there's a couple things that happen over and over again that deceive people. And one of them is when a boxer moves up too many weight classes. And we just saw this happen with, um, oh crap, Pacquiao against, um, I can't remember who he fought, but well, if you're the first person to mathematicize something, you yeah. can clean up. They tell me that there was very little math on Wall Street until the eighties. Right. And then all these quantum physicists came in with really sophisticated theories. Those guys all got super rich. And then everything was all mathed out, and now all math does is lead to, you know, international disaster. What kinda of happened in baseball? You know, and it, people are trying to have it happen in basketball. And I'm not sure it's going to work because it's a team sport and baseball is an individual sport. But in baseball, they figured out ways to statistically evaluate people and actually improve the team because some guys were undervalued. In boxing, though, you'll have things where somebody will – like Kelly Pavlik goes up in weight and he fights Bernard Hopkins. Kelly Pavlik's ideal weight is 160. He goes up to 168. It's a big eight pounds. He's fighting Bernard Hopkins, who's been 168 his whole life. Different kind of punching power. That extra eight pounds for when you're 160, it's pretty significant. But the odds for the for Pavlik, Pavlik was favored. Meanwhile, Hopkins is probably the best fighter of the last 15 years because people were betting on the 160-pound Pavlik, but he was really the 168-pound Pavlik. And that seems like... You know, statistically, if somebody just went through and tried to figure out every scenario where that's happened. Right. You just sit there with a bunch of books. It takes a few weeks. You set yeah. up a database. And, and the, other, the other scenario is when a guy hangs on too long and then comes back and takes those last three or four fights. For, for whatever reason, the odds never totally shift against him. Well, like Tyson. Tyson is carried- a good example. Sugar Ray Leonard. Um, Tommy Hearns. Ali, his last couple fights. I mean, you're talking about like one in three odds the guy's going to win, but the guy's always favored. So if you went through and you figured out all the times a washed-up superstar was taking those extra last few fights for money, I guarantee he wins 25% of the time. 
But I don't have that data because nobody's ever done it. So somebody should start a boxing website that figures this stuff out and throw themselves into it, and there's money to be made. I am giving that away for free. Joe Mead, should I give that away for free or should I keep that? Do you want to do it? What do you think? I don't think you want to do it. I don't want to give that away for free? No, you can give it away for free because you're not actually going to. Yeah, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. Here's Joe another... Mead agrees. I'm going to give that away for free. Here's another thing you should do is yeah. there must be a way to lobby Vegas to pitch them on setting up lines on new sports. Like rodeo. Can you bet on rodeo? I don't know. You probably can. Um, are there rodeo betting experts? I don't know. But like my my kid's a fencer. She does really well even though she has me for a parent because yeah. she, she uh, she's left-handed. And there aren't that many girl left-handed fencers. A southpaw. Yeah, and there's no def- – people don't know how to defend against a – Yeah. Anyway, set up like – can you bet on Olympic sports? I don't know. I, I – I feel like you can for stuff like Olympic bat. I know I bet on Olympic. I bet on Argentina in 2004. It's kind of unpatriotic of myself, but um, I don't know if you can bet on sports like fencing, though, and yeah. archery. That seems a little but, far. But if you can, if you can somehow persuade somebody to start taking bets on some obscure sport, and you're already set up to be the expert on that sport, it's true. So you're saying. Create a situation where you're the, you're the expert of the sport. Yeah. And, and then you... dominate that sport. Yeah. I guess Vince McMahon could do that, although technically wrestling's not a sport. Well, you can't bet on. No. Um, I kind of like my WNBA idea. That's... Maybe that'll be my third book. <laughs> that seems re- <laughs> a season inside the WNBA. <laughs> Betting the, what would that book be called? WNBA book. Money broads. I don't know. <laughs> you made a joke. We just talked about sports. I think this is a good way to get out. Okay. So you turn 50 in 14 months. 13. 13. You're, uh, you're continuing to write for Jimmy Kimmel Live. You're going to be on a show called Obsessed on CW. I think A&E. A&E. And anything else? I, I'm still rooting for midlife crisis. I've had a rolling crisis for the past 30 years. I'm see I'm I'm going to motivate you to get involved with some sort of sports stat thing. I really feel like like you you could hit the mother load with one of these things. All right, let's take down the WNBA. Maybe we'll take down the W, you know, the season starts in May. Maybe we have next. Okay. <laughs> Maybe we'll figure it out. Simmons and Rosner have next. All right, Rick Rosner, today's guest on the Subway Fresh Take Hotline. Do you like Subway? Yeah. You don't like to pay for food, unfortunately. No. But if somebody gave you a free Subway, you would love to eat it. Oh, I'd eat that like crazy. Especially like a 12-inch double meat? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Rick Rosner, our guest on the Subway Fresh Take Hotline. That's it for the BS Report today. Hopefully later in the week, (laughs) Adam McCroll and I (laughs) – why are you laughing? What? I don't know if I'm supposed to talk about Subway. Oh. Well, they're my sponsor. You can't help it. I asked you. Okay. (laughs) Uh, Hopefully later in the week, Adam Carolla, we're going to see um, Fast and the Furious either today or tomorrow, and he's going to come on and we're going to give our review. And the reason we're going to give our review... Oh, wait. Did you say the Fast and the Furious? Fast and Furious. I meant Fast and Furious. Okay. The reason we're going to give the review and the reason why uh, the franchise means so much, do you know why? Nope. Because Adam and I both live, live our lives a quarter one, mile at a time. Quarter mile at a time. When you're in that club, the movie means something. So stay tuned for that. As always, it's been fun. Until the next time on the BS Report. Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out.
And that concludes another episode of the BS Report. And here's 55 more words that Bill Simmons intended to mention, but unfortunately ran out of time. Now you can get any regular piled high subway foot long for just $5. The keyword is any. The sweet onion chicken teriyaki, savory chicken and bacon ranch, the meaty taste bud pleasing Italian BMT. All the regular famous subway foot longs, just $5. Subway, eat fresh. See store for details.